So I'm going to see if I can make this full screen. Thomasina, am I making it full screen? And that's where we are. Again, you're going to be hearing, seeing, watching a video, uh, a series of videos. Again, from uh, Chris Cochran and me, and I'm doing a conversation with Bill Newhouse and me, and then Meredith Dodd from me. Each of these folks works with data, but in different ways. And seeing as how the theme of this conference has to do with data superiority, right, using that, we felt that doing a presentation about security and data and how they work out was a great way to go. So you'll see a bit of an introduction here in a minute that it begins. Where are we in terms of time, folks? Shout out a time. Four minutes. Four minutes. Okay, so in the old vernacular, smoke them if you got them for the next four minutes. Um, I'll probably go around and say hello. Uh, if I really get a uh, crazy idea, I might even do a selfie eventually during this presentation because I'd like to record all of us there. So again, greetings from CompTIA. I'm glad that you are here. Anybody had a chance to get out on the beaches at all? Any ra anybody dare raise their hand? Nothing on the evening? Oh, where did, you, did you see anything? Yeah. So you saw the ocean and the beach. The reason I bring this up is because I was lucky enough yesterday I had a bit of time, a couple hours in the afternoon. Just right out front there, I was swimming with a sea turtle. So you, you can do that right after the show, but you have to wait, okay? You can't leave now. All right. So in just a few minutes, the presentation, Thomasina will automatically begin. Remember to scan your badge if you're here to get the continuing education credits. We're going to set you up for that. Did you have a question? Actually, not a question. Just to add on about the scanner. Oh, yeah, about the scanner. Here, let me throw this at you real quick. There you go. Hi, just one quick thing for the scanners. The scanners will, be, will open up for scanning at 2.55, and then they will close. This session is at 4? Is that 4? That's right. Yeah, the, so the scanner will close at 4.15 as well. So make sure you guys, um, when, after, once the session is complete, if you guys want to talk to our great presenters, I would ask you guys to get your scan done first and come over and talk to them so you don't miss your opportunity for your CEU points. Thank you very much. I love that. Professionalism. Everybody give her a big hand. I like that. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, don't dare ask them of me. Just kidding. If you have any questions at all, you can contact me. I'll be right over there, right? Or probably kind of flirting around here saying hello to people. Uh, I've got some cards here if you want to get a hold of me. Um, even if you were to contact me, if I'm in a really good mood, maybe you get a voucher out of me if you're really persuasive or something. Just saying. Um, so thank you again for your time, everybody. Thank you again for your service, for those of you who are active military. And I'll be uh, talking to you shortly.
No. No, hold on here. to go to settings and look for audio. Sound settings. Uh, also, Bill's going to talk to you about some of the initiatives that NEST has been getting involved in having to do with the tagging of data and the importance of understanding what you're securing, specifically information. And then also, uh, Meredith, who is a former uh, U.S. Army E-4, uh, who made the transition from the Army into being a data analyst. So you're going to get a look at data and security from a couple of different perspectives. Before we join them, I want you to think more about your work as a security professional, because this has been a major sea change in that more and more we are all as security workers involved in the data chain or the data life cycle, uh, meaning the collection of data, the mining, the analysis, the visualization and governance, the compliance, all those elements of data are very important to understand. There's so many data oriented jobs right now already, whether if you talk about it in terms of uh, the 8570 initiative or the upcoming 8140 initiative or the nice NIST initiative. Uh, take a look at it, for example, there are jobs such as data analysts, right, that are listed uh, as number 422. There's the cyber defense analyst. There's the system security analyst. All of these uh, uh, reflect a, a need to understanding data. Uh, there's the cyber defense forensic analyst, the cyber defense incident responder, oh, so many of these elements. But it's more than just these job roles. For example, uh, mid uh, last year, uh, the, B Dave Spurk was named uh, the DOD Chief Data Officer. That's a new position. Well, why did they create that data officer? Because data is the new element that's attacked. So it's just been a couple of years, less than a couple of years, that he's been in that position. I think it's very important to understand this transition that we're all experiencing towards data and security. Let me give you a bit more context. We did some research at CompTIA and asked organizations, large and small, what are some of the important, the most important uh, solutions that data security professionals uh, provide? And the answer, number one, was security monitoring. Well, by security monitoring, we get into this because it has to do with data analytics. There's been web analytics, been around for years, and business intelligence, been around for years. Security analytics, newer, but part of the deal. I think it's really important to understand our job is to gain actionable information as security professionals. We slice and dice and capture information to create accurate narratives, to put these things on a screen and into reports for everyone to see, to take those ugly log files and turn them into trends that people can understand using, let's say, the elastic stack, things like that. This way we can help identify pivot points, whether you're talking about the MITRE attack model, whether you're talking about the diamond model, you're basically capturing the tactics, the techniques, the procedures that hackers are being able, that, are, that they're using. And you're also capturing indicators of attack and indicators of compromise to identify specific patterns. See, more and more, we are turning into data analysts because we're taking Lockard's exchange principle, the idea that a perpetrator of a crime will bring something to the crime and leave something at the crime. That allows us to analyze that. We have to know how to analyze those things. So as we profile TTPs and all those elements, we become more information curators than we are just information custodians. We need to be more than just uh, plumbers of uh, information or security workers that put security controls in place. We need to understand what we're securing, APIs. We need to understand the privacy of information. 
So let's get into it. Let's talk to Chris uh, 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 first as he tells us more about what it means to be a threat hunter uh, combined with being a data analyst. Well, welcome everybody. I'm here with Chris Cochran. Chris Cochran is a threat hunter. You've also done work with something that you uh, and a partner put together called Hacker Valley, isn't that right? That is correct. Yeah, I've been uh, all over the, the cybersecurity realm, uh, threat intelligence, threat hunting, purple teaming, leading security operations, kind of all over. Uh, but I am officially now a content creator. So I went from the practitioner uh, side of cybersecurity and now I'm really focused on getting the word out there, inspiring and empowering folks uh, with knowledge and inspiration. You know, tell us just a bit about your work history, uh, the outfits that you've worked for traditionally. Oh yeah, I've, I've run the gambit. I was at the National Security Agency as a United States Marine. I was at United States Cyber Command when it stood up. I had my own company standing up threat intelligence capabilities. I've done work for the House of Representatives, the Department of Justice. I've worked at Mandiant. I was at Booz Allen Hamilton. I've even led threat intelligence at Netflix, uh, which was a, a crazy awesome adventure. And also led uh, security operations for a financial technology company called Marketa. Now I work uh, for myself and also with a company called Exonius. Uh, this focus on asset management and uh, all we do uh, my partner ron and i uh, we make content for technologists around the world all day long and it's been a dream well it's fantastic i mean so this military background that you have and the work uh, you've done for various uh, uh organizations to me it's a nexus or a, a combination of of you could call it traditional or even next level security and data. Where did you, was there a point where you kind of went, well, this is, this is interesting. I'm a security guy, but I'm also a data guy. Where, where, where do those th two areas meet up? Yeah, I think we almost forget that we work in this field of information technology and information mm -hmm. security. So when we think of information security, we tend to go towards the endpoints almost immediately. We think about the computers that we use and the servers and the cloud and the internet of things and, and BYOD, things like that. But really at the end of the day, what we're really trying to secure is data. Uh, when we look at data breaches, that's a data breach. It's a security breach, but more importantly, yeah. it's a data breach. The data is going somewhere that it's not supposed to go. And those are some of the most damaging breaches that we can think of because it could be everything from PII to credentials to intellectual property. There's so much information and money in data. So that's really what we almost have to think about when we think about our jobs as cybersecurity practitioners is we're not just protecting the assets, we're not just protecting operations, we're at the end of the day protecting the data as well. I remember when it was, I protect systems. You know, seriously, you talk, right. you know, we're protecting the systems. And uh, yeah, and then, then there was that shift to protecting say people or information. Cause I think mm -hmm. that's, I mean, isn't that the traditional approach though? You know, that, well, I put security controls in place. It doesn't matter what I'm protecting because the controls will take care of it. Why is that inadequate? Yeah, I would say the reason why that's inadequate uh, from a couple perspectives, from a culture perspective, I tend to think of cybersecurity as people centric at the end of the day, because we want to enable folks uh, to do their jobs. We want to enable our customers to operate within our ecosystem securely and safely. So we're at the end of the day protecting them. But then you go down a level and now you're protecting operations. If you can't do your operations, then you're not able to operate as a business. And then if you go even further down that rabbit hole, at the end of the day, again, it's data. So you you can't just protect the systems because the, the system could be fine, but the data is going somewhere that it's not supposed to go. This could be everything from user error. Maybe someone put information somewhere that it's not supposed to be all the way through that an intent attacker trying to take information and dox it, uh, put it out on the internet for usage, or even trying to monetize it on things like the, the dark web or anything like that. So sensitivity to the data that you're actually protecting is very important. I, I often say uh, uh, today's security worker is not necessarily a data custodian, kind of a data curator in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. You have to really be aware of it. 
Yeah, that curation is a, a key word when you're talking about data, because believe it or not, when we're in our organizations, we tend to forget how much data really is in our ecosystem. We tend to only think of the data we can access readily, but really there is a, a complete treasure trove of data within our environment. And that's really what enables us as security practitioners to really ask good questions of our environment. It's all about getting it in a place that's cohesive and also queryable, if that makes sense. Queryable, no, well, it makes sense because whether it be Elasticsearch or, yep. or, or Splunk or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. whatever tool you happen to be using, it's been so interesting to see as as you as I talked with uh, the Red Hunters, such as yourself, security analysts, they're searchers. I mean, there are people yeah. that are, are doing all sorts of queries and and they're manipulating data, visualizing, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Tell us, tell us a bit more about you know your specific job as a threat hunter. Such a, a cool name. I often will say. Uh, um, you know, Threat Hunter, it sounds like a, a really bad, like, uh, what, mid-80s hairband album. <laughs> anyway, it's a, tell us more about your, your work as a Threat Hunter in regards to data. Yeah, when it comes to data, it's really almost, you, you have to think of yourself as almost like a scientist, because when you're Threat Hunting, you start with a hypothesis. Like, this is happening out in the world, or maybe it's something that doesn't even quite exist yet. You're constantly thinking about the attacker. What does the attacker want to do? And what does the attacker look like within the, the ecosystem or the environment? And then you start to then say, okay, so this is my hypothesis. If they wanted to do this, this is where they would go. Or perhaps even this is what they would do. And you try to look for signs that would give you clues that this is going on in your environment. So if there's a, an attack that's going on in the world right now, but none of the conventional solutions can detect it yet, maybe you come up with a hypothesis on how you would be able to detect it. So you have to go through that treasure trove of information. You have to know where to look and where to query. You have to pull that information in a way that you can ask those questions to say, okay, if I wanted to find this, what would that look like? And then once I'm able to find it, uh, maybe this is what I can do to either prevent it or ultimately make something like a uh, detection logic that can automatically look for this stuff as, as time goes on. So that's where it starts. It really starts with the hypothesis. You're being a scientist. I think this is what it would look like. I think this is how we could detect it. And then you go find it manually or through some type of scripted means and then eventually get to the point where it's automated for you. So then you can go on to the next hypothesis. So it's interesting, as I've heard you talk, as I heard you talk about, say, hypothesis, and then mm -hmm. you even talked about if then, you know, conditional thinking. I mean, this right. is, it is very logical and it's something that does tie right into data manipulation. When you're doing that kind of data manipulation, you mentioned, say, scripting or, or manual. What are, you, what are you working with? Are you working, you know, you can mention a specific tool or are you, sure. are you working in spreadsheets or how does that work? Yeah, my prim when I was primarily doing hunting, I was doing it in Splunk. Splunk's really good as long as you have someone there that is really focused on building out that architecture and really pulling in all the information that you need. Uh, without information, like, there's not really a lot that you could do. So as long as it's really deployed correctly and intelligently and you build your dashboards and you build your uh, different pages in which you can do some of the, the hypothesis, some of the visualizations, it's really gonna make it easier for folks that are dealing with big amounts of data. Because I mean, we aren't computers at the end of the day, we're human beings. Uh, yeah. Maybe there's the, the chosen few that can look at data, just square on and see the patterns. But for me, I, I have to have it visualized in some type of way. So I need the dashboards. I need uh, certain pages that have certain fields that are populated so then I can get to the meat of the matter much more quickly. So as you're putting together these dashboards, uh, it, it's a little bit more than uh, 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 taking a report from, uh, let's say, uh, op open vaz or, or an Nmap scan or a bunch of logs, right. right? I mean, you have to put together a story, a narrative, oh, right? Oh, hundred percent. One one of the coolest stories that uh, I've put together in the past, and really, honestly, it wasn't me. It was the, the Splunk engineer that that put everything together. Is uh, we wanted to do investigations on things like phishing, like phishing campaign. So if we wanted to see a phishing campaign, we wanted to pull from different sources, not just our uh, email, uh, email uh, solution, not just uh, things on the endpoint. We wanted to really be able to tell that story. So we have different 
fields that come from different solutions and be able to help tell us that story much more quickly. Because sometimes in a large organization and when you get a campaign, it could be hundreds if not thousands of emails that you're dealing with. And so you're dealing with the potential click of hundreds and thousands of emails and being able to, to verify whether someone clicked an email or not, being able to understand like the, the, the scope and the scale of a particular attack is going to be super important. If you're starting with just from raw data, that can be really, really hard unless you're really familiar with how to do that decision logic on the fly, but it's much easier if you can organize it in a way where you can ask those questions immediately. Couple of questions. Who put together that data feed as it were, you know, the email? Was that the uh, was that the Splunk engineer talking to the email email folks for the organization? Or, so, or did you do that? How that worked? So how that works is we have different solutions. We had an email solution that blocked a lot of the inbound crap that was coming in. And so we could take the information from that source and we say, okay, out of the all the fields, out of this API. Uh, what information is the most important and what do we want to display on this dashboard? So we're like, okay, so obviously uh, sender is really, really important. Uh, maybe um, that IP is important, this IP is important. Uh, maybe we need to understand the attachments. Uh, what are the links that are embedded within the, the email itself? So asking like, if you were gonna go through like an incident response and you said, okay, there was a single email that came through, someone clicked it, what are some of the questions that I would immediately ask that I don't have to now that we have some of this automation, we have ties to this information from the email solution. So what are some of the questions that I'm gonna ask immediately and automatically just pull that stuff over so you don't even have to ask. So that's really how you start to onboard. Like if you wanted to do like a end-to-end -end spectrum, like, hey, I need all the data enrichment from all these different solutions to ask the questions that we're asking from uh, an IR or even just a, a basic triage perspective. You know, when you mentioned IP, you were, were you talking about IP addresses or you're talking about intellectual property? Uh, IP addresses. Okay, I just not to make sure. Yeah, That's yeah, what I yeah. figured. Okay, uh, so and who, as you were putting together, so you got all the data and then you mentioned putting together dashboards and creating a narrative. Who was your primary audience? Who were you preparing those reports for? Yeah, so uh, I would look at dashboards and reports as maybe two separate things. When you're looking at things like dashboards, those are for the, the operators, the folks that uh, really need to, to be able to manipulate the data maybe. You might have a dashboard or two for the execs or the leaders because they want to check the health of something or maybe they want to see how many outstanding tickets there are from an operational perspective. But really, I would say the, the dashboards, the, the interfaces to be able to, to manipulate the data are really for the operators. I would say on the other end, you have reports. You can print reports from whatever uh, solution you're using to do some of the, the data manipulation. Uh, a lot of places can pull reports like that. And those reports are going to be either for historical knowledge or for the, the leadership to use uh, for operations. For operations. Now you mentioned operators, you know, dashboards. Thing. When you say operators, are you talking about, uh, say, security analysts? Or tell us what you mean by operators. Yeah, that they, that could be end to end. So uh, okay. we, during that, that team that I'm really speaking about right now, uh, we led uh, not only like the threat hunting stuff, not only the tier three security operations work, but also like threat intelligence. And so you could use the internal information to help fuel intelligence collection, to help uh, fuel uh, intelligence requirements and things like that. So anybody that really needs to manipulate the data to ask the questions is really an operator. So this is security okay. analysts, this could be incident responders, really anyone that's going to be hands-on with the data to help come to an occlude, to a conclusion, make a decision or take an action. How do you go about collecting the data? And I'll, I'll ask this question kind of in another way. What, what were some of the biggest challenges you've ever seen and overcome as you initially collect that data? So there, there's two giant issues when it comes to data uh, and one overall arching umbrella of this uh, concept of complexity. Data is becoming more and more abundant in our environments. So how do we take the this noise, all this noise, all the stuff that's going on and get to the signal? So there's a couple things that you have to do there. One is being able to get it all in a place that's usable. Uh, they, they use different frameworks, they use different parameters. Uh, some 
uh, solutions uh, might call an IP address just IP. They might call it IP.adder. There, there's different ways of calling the very, very same thing. So being able to have that translation, if you're looking for a way to say, okay, show me the context for all the stuff that's going on with this particular asset. Being able to get all that information in a place that's first usable is really, really tough. Then also with the, the data, sometimes you'll have uh, duplication of data, which can really mess with things like counts. Sometimes you need, okay, if, if I'm doing something with asset management, I need to be able to count how many devices might have this particular uh, application or this particular software. And now, now you're, if you're not deduplicating your data, there's gonna be a little bit of a problem because now things are being counted twice. So really getting clean data is really, really complex and making sure it's deduped, making sure that things are matching up can be really, really complicated for someone that's not initiated to how to deal with data on such a large scale. Well, and it's, it's complex, not only for people who don't know about data and how you can, like you said, dedupe things and basically bring some sort of order out of chaos, but also mm -hmm. you have to know your security stuff in order to do the proper deduping or right. else you'll be dumping very valuable information, right? Yeah, I'm sure you've seen that sort of thing. Oh yeah, all the time. I mean, sometimes you can't see the, the forest from the trees. When you're on top of the data, it just seems like junk, but uh, yeah. we had someone on the podcast and uh, that episode is actually gonna be coming out here real soon. And she <laughs> was talking about black swans versus gray rhinos. Uh, when we talk about these big emerging threats, these big events, sometimes the media likes to say, oh, it was a black swan. No one had any clue that this was coming. Uh, but if you get closer to the details, you see that it's actually more of a gray rhino. This is something that you can see coming. Sure, it mm -hmm. might be scary, but you can at least plan for it. So when you look at things like incident response, sometimes uh, there's a lot that's going on in your environment, but if you were able to key in on some, certain anomalies, certain things that were suspicious, or even some of the malicious stuff, you might have seen a particular intrusion happening much earlier than you did earlier. Give us an idea of what some of this data that you are bringing in, uh, about what that looks like. I mean, uh, log file data, for example, uh, what else? Really, it's, it's everything you can conceive of. So think of it from this context. Uh, when we look at things like asset management or uh, we're, we start to talk, talk about asset intelligence, but that's even a step further. When we look at things like asset management, it was relatively easy in the beginning, right? We had maybe a few endpoint devices and we had a server or two, but then we started to bring in additional Sorry, everybody, we'll try to get this resolved quickly.
Well, folks, I'm sorry about the audio mix-up. What we'll do is we'll get back to you in about 10 minutes. I'm downloading a separate file. We'll be able to solve these uh, audio problems. So uh, take a break. Come back here in, uh, uh, yeah, I would say at 40 after, right? That's about 10 minutes, and we'll be ready. Welcome, everybody, uh, to securing information in today's technology. It's all about, it's all about securing the information. Uh, I'm James Stanger. I'm here to talk to you today uh, about data and security. I think it's an interesting combination, what I call the dynamic duo. Uh, this is the first uh, pleased to meet missed. you. I'm James. I've done a lot of work with cloud security, with pen testing, with security analytics. And I'm here to represent CompTIA. If you've never heard of CompTIA before, we do a lot of education. We're a membership organization. Uh, we do a ton of research. And I'm here to talk to you about some of the research that we found. Our agenda, specifically, is going to be an introduction to data and security. Again, the new dynamic duo. And to introduce you to three subject matter experts I want to get, I want you to get to know. Uh, Chris Cock. 40 after, right? But we'll start it right, you know, pretty much near the end of Chris Cock. And so we fast forward it to about there, right? Should I do that? Yeah. I wish I would have. Oh, don't worry about that. And so how many of these interviews are here? How many interviews does this video capture? It's the whole thing. It's the whole thing, great. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just start right there? That's when it really was bad. And then we'll start here in uh, just uh, about nine minutes. Is that sound fair enough? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Status update. Uh, we've solved the problem, but we'll still wait till about 40 minutes after uh, to restart the video. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask me any uh, questions uh, right now about what you've heard, or you can contact me over there. But we'll re be restarting this in just about eight minutes or so. Thank you.
you're going to have to bring that data in a way that's queryable. Again, uh, you might have to bring it in a way that's real time because we've all been there before. Where you know the audit's coming up, we got to make sure we got all our, our our ducks in a row. So now we're pulling all this information from all these places. We might be doing what we're supposed to be doing, but it's not in a way that we can pull it easily and say, "Hey, here you go, uh, auditor. We have all the information. This is all of our processes. This is how long it takes us to to do these certain things from a security perspective." Uh, being able to answer those questions quickly is really what's important. And so that goes back to data hygiene, that goes back to data enrichment, that goes back to data uh, correlation and um, enrichment just all, uh, for all intents and purposes. So really it's the same stuff. Like how do you ask questions, get the questions quickly and clearly and move on with your day. So when it comes to enrichment, uh, tell us a bit, uh, just a bit more about that. And he also mentioned the idea of querying. And I'm curious, as you set up data to be queryable, who's doing that querying? You or is it your your uh, business, uh, not your business partner, but the, the client that you're working with? So tell us about enrichment and then yep. about querying. Yeah, enrichment is all about what is the context that will help me make a decision much more quickly than if I didn't have that that data. So if you're looking from an incident response perspective, uh, you say, oh, wow, uh, we have an, an external IP that's uh, filling with one of our internal IPs. Well, what information do we have both on the internal IP and the external IP? Is there threat intelligence for that external IP that might give us an answer as to like who this might be or what they might be doing or what they might be after? And on the internal side, uh, is this tied to any of our critical assets? Is this an endpoint that might be uh, tied to a very important person. So giving that, that data enrichment of like, okay, tell me the story of what's going on in my environment so I can help make that decision and take that action. And uh, what was the, the second part? We talked about data enrichment and then mm -hmm. how do you make, uh, in making data queryable, right. the person who you are, uh, you're setting up that data, who's the audience or who's the person who's gonna do the query, you or you someone else? Yeah, so who sets it up is probably going to be that security engineer that's dealing with that 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 particular solution, or maybe it's the person that's in part in charge of the data lake or the sim, whatever people are using to, to get data in. And the person that's going to be doing the querying is going to be the threat hunter. It's going to be okay. the incident responder. It's going to be the security analyst, the person that needs to ask those questions. So it's important for them to not only understand how to query, but what data is queryable within this, this context. So if you have a Splunk or you have an Elk stack, you're like, okay, so I know all these things are connected to this instance. So these are the questions that I can ask. And sometimes, I mean, it, a lot of folks don't have this stuff off, off the top of their head. You might have to play around with uh, the query language a little bit to say like, okay, I want to be able to get to this answer. It's not going to be, uh, uh, you know, a one-to-one, -one. like you're not going to just say, okay, this query is going to work in every instance, but you might have to fiddle around with the, the language a bit to be able to get the answer you're looking for. No, Chris, this is great. Thank you very much. One last question. As you are hiring somebody for this type of work, you know, putting together, whether it be threat hunting or whatever, what are some of the data oriented skills that you are going to look for, say in a resume or, or as you're interviewing someone, you know, what would you ask of her or him? Yeah, at a high level, uh, we'll, we'll go to a couple of different levels. At a very high level, you're looking for creative thinking and the ability to, to have agility when it comes to having problems. When you're trying to connect different data points, when you're trying to bring data into a place that's usable, a lot, yeah. it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy just from the, the cut and dry perspective. There's also going to be issues. There's going to be compatibility, compatibility issues. You're going to have to work your way through some of that troubleshooting and that can be that can be time consuming uh if you're not going to be able to have that type of talent in in-house you're going to have to outsource it because if your goal is to integrate all these different solutions and you don't have the skills internal to your your company to do it you're going to have to ask for help in some way or another or hire that person so just at the high level that agility creative thinking uh uh going beyond sort of the, the realm of what has been done before is really, really going to be important. Being able to hit your head against those, those challenges is really important. But then even at the very tactical level, 
understanding the data itself, like un being able to deal with different solutions, different types of uh, solutions, different frameworks, different schema, because schemas are very, very different, like we were talking about before. And if we want to get it in a way that we can see how one solution relates to another, you're going to have to do some of that schema relationship work as well. So thinking about things like that, uh, having some coding skills uh, is going to be important because sometimes, uh, let's be honest, when you're a young vendor, you might not have the integrations like you would hope. It might be a great solution, but your environment just isn't conducive to what they have. So you might have to write something yourself. You might have to bring it into the, uh, the, uh, the MSA with the, the vendor to have them build stuff for you. So just understanding some of the nuances of build versus buy, understanding like, hey, I can help build this integration and I can't. Understanding the data, the schema, understanding things like encryption, uh, understanding uh, some of the, the more uh, important regulations from a PCI perspective or maybe HIPAA information. Understanding those things are important too. So it's really nuanced when you're dealing with data centric things and you're dealing, you're the person that's helping protect data. So just having that additional context, having that additional experience and exposure is gonna help you be a great uh, data security person. Terrific, and when you mentioned schema and you mentioned some programming, but you say, I can't help but think of things like XML or Python yep. or uh, mm. uh, YAML, things like that, does that all make yep. sense? Exactly, exactly. Uh, just having exposure to them, dealing with those, uh, doing troubleshooting when things aren't communicating correctly, dealing with things like APIs, dealing with CSVs, all, all that great stuff uh, helps when it comes to getting a job with data. Chris, thanks so much for your insights. Uh, really very much appreciate it and uh, hope to be uh, catching up with you soon. Absolutely, it's always a pleasure. Well, you just heard from Chris Cochran who talked about his experience working in the private sector as a threat hunter. Uh, and the importance of understanding what you're securing, the combination, once again, of data and security. Well, I thought it'd be a good idea to get somebody from the government sector. So without further ado, Bill Newhouse uh, from the uh, NIST will tell us more about the importance of understanding data and security. Well, here we are with Bill Newhouse of the, uh, uh, from NIST. You are a NIST cybersecurity engineer, is that right, Bill? Indeed, thanks, James, for, for having me and bringing good. me to this to this opportunity here. Yeah, it's good to have you here. You know, Bill, tell us a bit about your background, and let's start talking about data uh, and security, about how it's all about the data, etc. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop back all the way to when I was 18, and I was an engineering student and a cooperative education student, which means I was going to be doing work study and going to a, a, an employer, and I got a cool job at a place called the National Security Agency, and. After a bit of an orientation, they, they introduced me to an organization called the Telecommunications Directorate. And I was like, oh, okay. Later, I eventually asked why. And they said, well, because Georgia Tech, where you went to school, or at that time was are going to school, has a strong program in telecommunications. And I was like, okay. I, I was 18 and a half. I was a, I was a freshman going to become a sophomore. And, and so I showed up in this telecommunication organization and started working on wideband communications. And so the, the first thing I knew about data security was there were crypto devices called KGs and they, they had a, you had a cipher text side and you had a plain text side and the plain text is the stuff that the people who need to see it can read and the cipher text is the data trans, trans being transmitted all over the world in, 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 and not being able to be read by anybody who would intercept it. So you get a bit of a security mindset from that. So, so did that for 15 to 20 years of my NSA career and then found some other opportunities within NSA that took me towards uh, research and engineering and science and technology oversight. And there the focus was specifically on information assurance. That was the name of a directorate at NSA still, you know, what it isn't anymore, but information assurance is kind of a, a big telling name of something. Um, and then we've evolved to calling it cybersecurity. So that evolution towards information assurance and the research and development and science and technology foundations to make more of it happen led me to meet NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and the people there who were doing this great work and still do for the committees for, for the non-national security part of, of our nation's government. And we've expanded our focus and we use the word cybersecurity almost exclusively these days. And I, I, I have landed within NIST at our Applied Cybersecurity Center. 
uh, which has the lovely full name of the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, but simply an applied cybersecurity center. And here I'm, I'm focused on trying to do projects that demonstrate more cybersecurity is reachable, possible. Uh, and I'm doing one that you, you caught wind of called data classification. Right. And, and, and that's where, you know, we're focused on there's this word data. And it, it struck me as I gave you that long winded who am I thing, information assurance didn't, didn't sound like security. It sounded like information matters. Let's assure its value and use and, and care. And, and we lost that when we started saying cybersecurity because then it, it felt like we were, we were the guys supposed to be protecting devices and things. And, and now, now we've got, we've got data security as a project and we're, we're aiming to show that it is data classification, that you, there, there's an, a value to knowing all your data if you think you're going to secure your mission or business space. And so this is relevant to, to all the sectors in our, in our economy at this point. You know, we've, because I was going to say that, that, you know, data and security is, is seen as a kind of a new skill set. But for you, based on the history that you just discussed, it's not necessarily a new skill set. It, it, it's, it's evolving to understand there's, there's a higher mission purpose to every organization, right? So, so I knew essentially what that was when I was at the National Security Agency, but I had to grow into it. I mean, it was easy for me to dive into the telecommunication gear and just make sure circuits worked and I was providing enough bandwidth based on the constraints of the, the medium we were transmitting over. Could be four wire communication, could be fiber optics, could be satellite, whatever it was. I didn't have to know what was valuable or, or less valuable at the time. I just had to make sure it worked and, and we could maintain it and run it. And that's, that's a little naive. I mean, there were lots of built-in databases that, that then said, well, here's the customer, know, you know, know which ones are most important in your facility. You kind of grew into knowing that, but it wasn't the words that, the words weren't focused upon deeply as people were talking about security. They were kind of, you know, let's make sure this circuit here works. And as you, as you evolve, you start to, to be, you know, a little more like what else is happening here? And, and, and it becomes more important to know what's the value of the data and what, how does it support everything? And then you, and I, I've moved away from that national security part of the stuff to trying to support conversations that support all our critical infrastructures, healthcare, IT, retail, hospitality, um, financial services sector, you know, different, different focus in each of these areas, but what's their missions are and what the data that matters and, and manufacturing, you know, all these have different kinds of data that matters to them. And, you know, I, I will fail at telling you is data a plural thing or a noun or, you know, a, or a singular thing, but it is, it is all your, everything you do is based on some handling of data these days. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's an important place to, to, to grow and expand your focus if, if you, if you want to be one of those people who has a, the big picture and can really talk to all risks. Well, there's no question because uh, it's interesting with this journey that you had, it, it was, you know, almost a, very much a systems assurance kind of thing, but then very quickly, or, or at least over time, the idea that data, you know, became the first concern, you know, that we live kind of a, in a data first, information first kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, for example, we have a new chief data officer, right? Uh, at the DOD Davidsburg, for example. And, you know, why, for example, is, is that significant? How is that significant to what you've just been discussing? I, I think that the, the fact that I think most federal agencies have a chief data officer often and or a chief privacy officer. So they might have two people in those titles or they might have one person with both titles. It is a, it is a reflection that, that it, you know, that it is about the data and that there are new pushes to force organizations to handle it with more care, including yeah. privacy issues and privacy, uh, you know, the individual's right to privacy and the ability to protect that privacy. Uh, there's so much more uh, computing going on. I mean, it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous. And, and because of that, there's a lot of clever things you can do with data and monetize it and use it. And that also means it can be exposed to others who could abuse it. And, and so that, that's a, just a big tell that uh, these organizations know they need somebody who can help them think deeply about it and connect, connect with the people who make value happen from the data with the people who help you move it around and support and control it. And uh, we, we haven't used the words cloud yet. You know, I mean, there's a whole lot of, you know, there's stuff that's 
you used to you think you're keeping it locally and you had to do things to protect it based on it's inside your fence inside your building inside your vault whatever you want to call it and that those boundaries are, are so are, are so hard to see anymore and often don't exist now it's different kind of boundaries that a data centric person will be in a much better position to think about other ways to reuse stuff the protections that are necessary and, and just uh, how and the risks that need to be mitigated based on those choices well i think it, it, it's really important because uh as workers take that journey right to becoming more impactful right uh you have to focus on where the data is living and, and what's going on because you're right traditionally it's like well, it didn't matter what was going on uh, what was being transmitted, et cetera, because I just focus on, let's say, perimeter security or on some intrusion detection or whatever. But now it's, it, if the attackers are going after the data that's being stored or data in transit, then you know, we've, got a big, we've got to focus on the elements where the hackers are, you know, the data, the applications and the APIs. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah and, and you and I have spoken in the past and at one point in my career before I, I got into doing cybersecurity or information assurance on a, on a level where I was thinking beyond that protect the protect the data as it leaves my facility which was that crypto device I was telling you about once I got past that I, when I, I used to look back on that career and I would say oh I was I was a I was a data plumber and and I actually recognizing the plumbers are pretty pretty darn valuable in, in society for you know for, for lots of great reasons and, and if you have a really good plumber, they can also point out other things that might happen, you know, in your facility based on your choices about what you do with water. Well, you know, and, and, and what could break first and where to where to lay a pipe in, in, in a wall that might be, you know, touching a ten, out the outside weather, which today is 10 degrees. You know, the bad things can happen. And, and so you want somebody who also knows a little bit more than just it, this will work, but this will work and there's some risk by putting it here. And so I, I recognize that, you know, it, it didn't sound as flattering and, and, and it, didn't, it didn't reflect that, you know, you talked about sort of people wanting to grow into their careers and know more. Well, you know, the people who do that and find success are often curious about how things work, I think. And, and, they, and they connect and they feel value being part of an organization because they know what the organization's focused on. And, and, and it won't be very often that the organization is entirely focused on running the pipes. You know, if, if, if there's water in my kitchen, it's because I'm gonna use it to add to the recipes and cook good food. If there's water in, in you know, anywhere else, I'm gonna use it to water the plants, I'm gonna use it, you know. So like just being the plumber doesn't let you live in your, in your environment and, and being the data, you know, focused person and you know, doing things to classify and know your data. Those are just fancy terms to catalog or know your data is, is now, you know, a great way to make sure you're entirely relevant to everybody that you work with. You know, if so, if data matters, right? You need to understand what you're securing, right? So the attackers are going after data in the applications and the APIs, for example. Uh, let's talk about, uh, just real quick, we can talk about this in a bit more depth, I suppose, later, but when it comes to a zero trust world as we move into it, right? In what way does that plumber, as it were, right, need to understand in a zero trust world, uh, the world of data? Every transaction, every, every I'm going to do something requires a, a reevaluation of trust in a zero trust architecture. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing better writers than, than I just said. Um, uh, and and so 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 you have to know you, you're preparing yourself in in a in a massive way and, and depending how big your organization is it gets bigger, but to to figure out how to ask a question about you know is is this still something I should be trusting, and 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 you're doing that because you have data you need to share and move and 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 make valuable in within the organization and with your partners and your customers and your your clients and, and all that so zero trust is everything we've always wanted to do as a as a as a buzzword in in the industry and and so then it becomes all right if somebody's selling you that you know what's the best way to prepare to do it and and often people say well you know do something micro segment your your network will be a great right. thing don't don't let don't let data that shouldn't be here go over there okay well to do that you had to know what's on that network you have to know what's the value of that network that's called data it, but they might say well take all your users and make sure they do something you know have them authenticate 
And then you might add some extra things about, well, let's, where are they authenticating from? What other factors can you know about them? That's data about them, but it's, it's also data you know to, to sort of say, well, James is gonna be the one who needs to see this data because he's gonna analyze it and use it and help us make more from, from knowing something. Okay, you know, let's keep track of, of you know, James is James, and, and we can offer more protections to say, James, you'll never need to do that while you're in Hawaii. You know, you live in the Pacific Northwest, but if you go to Hawaii, we don't need you to do that. And, and you know, that's data also is about all the elements of your network. So you're, you're going to be doing this whole landscape survey of everything you have. And really on top of it is the data that helps you prioritize where to start and what to do first. You know, what is the, what, how do you value this data? And, and it's not like people haven't been doing this. This is absolutely what everybody's been doing. Uh, libraries and, you know, they, they told you where the stuff was. And if it was sensitive or something, you know, proprietary, you didn't just leave it out in the public domain. And, and we've had a lot of, uh, as we move data into the digital domain, things you know have been have been leaked, borrowed, dropped. We've had data spills, and and you know by adding all this stuff, we hope to reduce that possibility, mitigate that risk, and and then you can control and use the data. It also implies that you have somebody who knows how to you know do all that control, and, and zero trust is 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 part of is offering that how to. I liked the metaphor you had uh, earlier talking about the data plumber. And one way I look at it too is the idea of, uh, uh, I think a lot of folks kind of saw themselves as, uh, well, I engineer the systems, right? Or I'm a, even a data janitor as it were, but really it's more of a data curation that, that uh, security workers have to move into. Sounds like what? And you're bringing people who, if you just say, stare at the, the pipes and if you don't see any water leaking, we're good. That's, that's, sounds old fashioned and you might not notice that the water is leaking in a direction you can't see. So, so by, by adding, adding a focus on data, you can start asking the questions, where else might I notice stuff? You know, what else can I do to, to, to see that something's about, you know, is, is potentially gonna happen, could happen, and therefore you, you'll have more opportunities to, to consider, can I afford to, can I prioritize to, to, to deal with that potential risk? And, and, and you, can, you can mitigate with other things, right? If, if, if it doesn't matter that the water leaks out and you catch it and it gets put back in the system, great. You've got a, that's a different kind of spill than if it leaves your control. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of different metaphors and, and ways to make people think about it. And, and I think it just puts you in a, in, a, in a good situation instead of being sort of passive and, and you know, trusting that what's happening is working. You're, you're going to be part of an active system of, of assessing that it is and that all the transactions of the data are being double checked. And, and I, I think that, that, adds, that adds a nice connection instead of thinking of the IT and the security people being down in the basement and supporting you foundationally, you are now, you are now saying they are part of our success. And I, and I tend to believe if people feel like they're part of the success or part of the, you know, making it happen that that's the same thing in my mind. They are they're going to feel motivated, and you know you've got to build. I I think that's the kind of employee you want to have. There's no question. Uh, attack, uh, there's the tactical kind of approach to IT. Uh, you know, IT as or even security as a cost center or as something separate or strategic IT, which is uh, I think an aspirational goal for some organizations. But it's very important to understand it in regards to truly securing the data, in, in that you bring in the security workers right at the beginning of, of, of projects, right at the beginning of, of uh, what's happening. Yeah, Pri privacy has been a big push on this space, right? That, that people yeah. had, had to follow regulations to deal with privacy and it, add, it started adding, hey, you know, I need to, you need to be able to delete me if I ask you to. And there's practical ways that that's actually been, been realized. Uh, but it started to draw people who wanted to be like, well, I. I now corporately am in charge of making this happen, but I'm not an IT or security person. They had to get to know the staff that could say to them, yeah, yeah I can delete it out of this one place it goes, but it also went elsewhere and I can't help you with that. And so it started creating these up and down your, what would be your old stack of your, or, your, your organization and really connect people together so that you had, you had your, your, anybody who wanted to talk about privacy, you started to recognize that they were good at figuring out where the data was. They're good at figuring out, you know, what else has happened with it so they can start to anticipate and probably improve the hygiene in a way so they can meet the regulations and be in compliance. 
and that probably opened up lots of, wait a minute, now that we, we've done that, there's something else we can do positive with this. And so, or, or it might support a different process within the business. So you've, you've, you've now, you've broken down silos that would, could cause you problems if you had them. And, and clearly we're talking about certain size organizations for that. You know, if you and I were talking to a small business, what are, what are, where are they going to get their services from? It's going to be cloud centric kind of stuff, but, but having a, a sense that, you know, they, they probably get that the data is the most important thing because that's how they make, you know, their business run. The, the, the transaction of a sale or the transaction of a shipment or supply chain decision that they're supporting is, is all there. And so, you know, they might have to learn to work with bigger entities that they sell to to be part of their data centric security model. And, and so there's, there's a, a, good, a good mix there where you could learn before you connect your camper up to the, to the water and the power, you know, you know what's, what's on the other side of that connector in a, in a good way for both parties. Now, Bill, you brought up the idea of you know, data, uh, privacy, hygiene, data security, and then the concept of privacy. Where does data tagging come into this? And because you mentioned, for example, the flow of data, you know, like, okay, uh, it's in a certain spot, okay, we can delete that, but then you said it's traveled on. And I'm thinking of both in terms of privacy, but also in terms of how do you secure that and, and really identify where it's all going? Because you can't just think in terms of perimeter security anymore. I think what's, what's happened over the last couple of years in various ways has kind of killed the idea of the perimeter finally, but. You know, I'm growing my, I'm growing my expertise in that space. In taking on this project, we are, we are listening to collaborators throughout industry sector, critical sectors, who say this is this is something that matters to us so i don't have the experience yet to to to, to totally anticipate that but but on that edge of your of your zone of trust your zero if you had a zero trust architecture and you had done and classified all the data that you find valuable before you give it away you can you can tag you know put those labels on it and so therefore when it shows up in the transaction with your partner you could say this is data that we by regulation have to privacy protect and and if if they're they may have to follow that so you're going to have to agree on labels so that they their system can ingest it and i think that's that's the space here that i don't have practical experience yet but through the project we're starting we we hope to we will gain that experience we'll be leveraging others experience in that space and and it and there's going to be some you know is there a foundation that we can describe that will be universally a good ontology to start the conversation well that'll be kind of high level and people will say, well, that's captain obvious stuff, I get that. Then the taxonomy for each individual kind of transaction that you, you're doing with a third party outside your trust, that's gonna be the way you labeled it this way, I labeled it that way. We, you know, That's your API perhaps, there's a conversation there. And, and being able to say that's where the security needs to go now, at some point you can't protect it after it leaves your space unless you've done something with, with like encryption. And in that case, you've got to have a structure, whether it's public key encryption where somebody has to come back, you know, they're playing with the, 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 the private and public keys to make sure that the data doesn't, you know, get, get borrowed by others because you, you, know, you haven't shared those keys or you do symmetric keys in a very fancy way. And then you have to deal with a new problem of distributing those keys. So, so you, it gets more complicated, but that's the kind of thing you may need to do with, with your more valuable data with, your, with certain kinds of clients. Um, there's, there's efforts after that, like, hey, I can stare over Bill's shoulder at his screen and look at his data. Well, you know, yes, and. And, and so, you know, there, there are some places where you, you'd limit that, you know, you might have new technologies that deal with that. But, but knowing your data is still the first step for all those willing to do commitments to, to support that and, and to really work it out. And, and there have been technology insertions in places where, you know, only a certain number of copies have gone out and it just disappears. And, I'm not an expert on that, but 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 that's that's fancy baseball, and, and then there's just everybody needs to play a certain kind of baseball, and, and we're kind of saying put on your helmet, you know, wear batting gloves, you have a little hand protection, helmets for your head, and maybe face mask, and and you know we'll work farther from that to put you know put more pads on you to do the security you need to make sure your data is protected, but it's uh, we got to work out some use case scenarios and really really show people here's where the here's where the friction will be the most for you, and then that lets you prioritize. To me, this is so much more advanced and so much more granular than the typical, uh, well, you know, we'll just worry about the data going inside or outside, or we can do some wholesale scrubbing or just blocking of data. You're now really getting into uh, ways that you can 
tag data so you can identify, you know, masking opportunities and things like that. Is that right? Or, or like if it's been attacked or altered, things like that. I th I, yeah, you know, the, the word masking sort of sounds bad because people would like, I, I can hold it up in the light and, and, and I can see through it. So, so you do have to kind of examine those schemes and you know, where I work that National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence is part of NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology. We have a role to, you know, validate crypto algorithms for federal use and often those same kind of validations are, are valued, valued at the, also by the private sector. So, you know, we would say, don't do something that you just magically thought up. And, and, and if it involves cryptography, there's some, some stuff to, to follow there. But, you know, that the techniques and the tactics, it, it, it gets complicated. It all relies on you need to know enough about your data to, to put in the time and the value to do it. And, and if, 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 you, if your customers will feel that you violated their trust by letting your, their data go to somebody else and they don't handle it the same way they thought you were or that you had promised or regulatorily you had to do, you've got some problems. So you know, I, I think I'm sliding around your question there a little bit, but you know, none, you know, none, of, this, none of this is rocket science new stuff. Uh, now I'm describing things that sound closer to rocket science, but it's like, it is hard. It is, yeah. it requires a diligence and, and it requires a, you know, just, it, it will make you better off if you if, if, if you require it of yourselves, you know. There's no que there's no question because you could argue it's hard in a sense, but it's it's certainly doable, but it's necessary. It's yeah, necessary. It's, it's that necessary. level of of specificity to help secure data these days. Mm -hmm. That's that's how conditions have changed, or how the baseball game has worked. If, if you didn't do any of this stuff, you wouldn't know you'd put it all in a storage tank right on the on the edge of your property that anybody is able to you know pull out of right, right. if if you if you thought you put all the grain of, you know, the grains of your your harvest in the barn and you didn't notice there were already you know mice and other things chewing through your bags you you know that's not good so this data classification stuff will will let you kind of you've marked it and then you should be able to mark where it goes because the zero trust architecture will help you support you know I know what transactions have occurred and, and you'll have a, a better chance of, of detecting when a spill or, or you know, when, when, the, yeah. when the mice chew through the bag and get into your stores. So, and, even, and even better how to, if there's automated response going on, you talked about yeah. store, for example, having that foundation of marked data, et cetera, will certainly help any sort of automation or even manual yeah. response. And, and, and I'm oversimplifying in a lot of these metaphors, clearly. There, there, are, there are things that people have been doing. And, and, and this also supports you know, the supply chain conversation has become big based on, on national incidents of, of this, this foundational thing in my technology has a vulnerability in it. And, and boy, that's everywhere. And how do I get that fixed? Yeah. So yeah, so, so and, and also, you know, we, ransomware and other kinds of concepts are scaring people. Well. You know, there are better data loss prevention things. They're, they're not better. There they have always been data loss prevention technologies, or at least the last 15 years, people have been offering that. And, and part of that was asking, well, what do you want to make sure you don't lose, right? And, and we're formalizing that a little more as we head towards zero trust. And we're going to ask the questions, you know, and offer some advice that, you know, functionally, you can get to these things. And here's how, and, and you have lots of vendors who can take you there. This is not a this is not a nascent space from a computer science point of view. It is it is nascent in how how ubiquitous it's becoming as a, as a as a value added thing, and 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 as we've been saying here, necessary thing. No, I think it's a great, a great way to put it because in a, in the same sense, and this is an analogy. You're saying it's 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 nascent in that. Uh, in some ways and, and not new in others. In other words, the idea has been around a long time, just the implementation has taken a while. Yeah. The same way that the cloud has been around for a long time, but it was you know fairly recently been truly implemented. Yeah. So. And, we'll, and we'll often say in computer science and you know, t noting that I told you about information assurance and, and you know, people would say computer security, info, info security, infosec, all those things have been going on for a while and but still what's a while mean you know when 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 did the you know the internet become the internet and you know we've had we had the arpanet and things way back the data that was on that was pretty much kind of understood to be university research and then somebody said well can i also do this can i do this and can i do this and and the, the ability for us to keep up with that well i think 
it happens, a data, a data focus, a data classification focus, a data centric focus is vital now because everything is interconnected. And, and so we're exposing more of it more often, you know, your medical records used to sit in a file in your doctor's office behind lock and keys. Great. Well, now they're going to a cloud service and you know, you're trusting them, you're trusting their cloud service, you're trusting the servers on which the cloud service has made its commitments. And so there's a whole lot of questions that we ask about the assurance of the devices and, and zero trust turns that on and, and exponentially grows it to say, let's check more often. Let's, let's keep doing this. And so it really does become foundational to do it first with the data as you answer any question. I mean, you, like I said earlier, you, you probably won't address micro segmentation unless you know why you're, 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 you're keeping operational technology from, from IT. Well, what's, what's the difference there? I mean, to me, IT is email and browsing, right? And I'm filling out forms and I'm doing business. OT is, is potentially you know, the templates for what you build, but it's also just the controlling mechanisms to make sure safety is happening inside your, inside your operational technology, to make sure that measurements are occurring and the data is being moved around. And, and it's certainly nice to know that if I clicked on a bad web link and it, had a, 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 it delivered a, a bit of malware and the malware checked my system and I'm, I'm three days behind on patching and it found something and suddenly I've been fished, that my vector didn't affect that operational technology you know, stuff. And so what was the data conversation in there? You know, there's smarter people than me who, who, who label all those things, but, but everything you do on your computer, there's a, you know, that packet, what, what's the central thing inside of a TCP IP packet? There's, there's, the, there's the data part of it. You know, there's a lot of addressing, there's lots of other stuff, but that, that data in the middle um, is, is, the, is, 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 the, is part of what can be exploited. Um, and, and that's important to, to kind of talk about in, in, in thinking about data. So for all of the schema, for all the analytics that's done, the ability to do that kind of tagging, yeah. the rationalization of it, the, the dealing with variances of how things are tagged, and yet it's still the same data, all those things. We need you know, people to, who can handle that. Let's talk about some job roles for, for a second. You know, there's the security analyst, for example, and, and there's the 8140 job roles or, or what have you. Uh, talk about, you know, for example, the data analyst or the, the, the cyber defense analyst, for example. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the NICE framework and the DOD workforce framework came out. The, they're, they're, they're essentially a similar structure. They, they were, I, the NICE framework took the DOD framework and tried to make it so more people could see it, and we've done that. And, and we describe these roles by, by saying there's tasks that they take on and there's knowledge and there's skills that, that people who perform these work roles ought to have. And, and we're gonna, you're gonna need to blend and grab and hold on to and, and, and as, as time goes on, it'll be easier to say, I, may, I need to do this, you need to have knowledge of these things, right? You know, if you're going to play basketball, you have to have knowledge that you can't just run with the ball without dribbling it on the ground, right? But you can run around the court without the ball, and you know, you have to teach people those knowledgey things that lets them understand the context. The skill part, well, that's a trickier one, but at some point, you're going to, if you're putting together a team, you're you're going to say, I need you to be able to do to demonstrate this skill, and then and that means you're demonstrating it to complete tasks. So there's a relationship between these tasks and knowledge and skills. So I. I tend to worry that we, 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 we put a label on it and the job next to it has a label and you really need to prioritize which, which parts of that, those roles are important for your teams as we move forward. And, and, and I think the data conversation can help you identify the tasks that are important to you, identify the ones that aren't listed. These are all strong opinions kind of publications when you say, you know, there's a, there's a work role defined in the NICE framework. It is meant to be the superset of all the things that that work role might take on and it's probably missing some stuff because it was thought of in a certain time frame by a certain group of people and so you know use those to, to start your conversation for people who come to CompTIA to say I, I want to I need a certification well the jobs descriptions and those roles ought to match up enough so they feel confident and then the question is if everybody's asking for data analysts, if you go to cyberseek.org and you see data analysts is on the top of the list, you, you tilt that way if that's what you kind of, you know, I, I think I could do this career and you, and you look towards certifications like you're offering or other companies might be offering other, other certifying bodies. 
because you can see the match there. But that's a lot of work for somebody, right? You know, we're trying to simplify the conversation. We're ho hopefully somebody here would know somebody who's getting into this career field and is like, wow, that sounds fun. I want to get there. Probably they're like, wow, that guy talks a lot, you know, instead. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like it when you talk, though. I appreciate it. No, it's, it's, but, it, but, it's, but we've, we're trying to define stuff enough that you can recognize that it is being valued. And we, we haven't necessarily built all the tools. CyberSeek is a tool that was created and CompTIA partnered with Burning Glass to take things that they could learn and what you guys already knew. And, and it can grow and, and you can interpret from it. And, and I have, a, I have a, a nephew just graduated with an IT, IT systems degree. And, and he already told me he needs to get, a, a con he, he told me he wants to get Security Plus. And I said, well, before you, before you pay for it, find out how many entry level jobs say you must have it. You know, so I'm asking him to find a connection between how somebody described a job, and I'm pointing it at my screen over here, which has the you know the work roles you just talked about, and and verify that you know you need to go do this before you show up at, at basketball tryouts, right? If 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 the basketball tryout you know job vacancy says you you better have proved to me that you can make a free throw, and your certification says I can make a free throw then I, I would let my nephew spend the money on it. Not everybody has the means to spend the money to get that training. So, so you know, there's a blend here to also learn when these things need to be applied. You know, does an entry level person need to know what? So these work roles give you uh, the potential to start every conversation and connect with what you're trying to figure out. Is that the career for me? Is that the, the way to get trained to do it and to be able to tell other people that I got that training through a certification? there's a language connection thing that should happen there. And it will need to be updated as we continue down this path. No question. Uh, Bill, one last thing I'd like to ask you about. Uh, one of the things that is always a concern in various agencies and various situations, corporations, the idea of threat actors rebuilding data to dangerous levels. In other words, they can kind of cobble things together, or take a look at data, exhaust or whatever, and kind of reassemble things to a, some sort of dangerous level. Do you know what I'm talking about? What does it mean to guard against that? How, how does data analytics or, or the tagging of data or what have you help guard against that? I'm pausing for a moment just to think if, if I have a strong recommendation yet. Um, <laughs> I, I, have, I have another example of the growing challenge in the space. Oh, okay. Let's take and a and and I, I've noted that one group, the, the Cloud Security Alliance, has a quantum safe working group. And so quantum computing, quantum computing as it becomes more and more realizable and, and advances are made, the the belief quantum, is is that like in other words, it's more available. Uh, well, yeah. So they don't exist today, but people believe that with time and, and clever clever research and, and hard work, there will be quantum computers in the future that are that will be able to, to essentially tear apart the protections that public key encryption offers today. They'll be able to factor things and, and break apart and get the keys and then go back and use those keys to, to, to pull apart and open data that's been, that's been encrypted. So back when I said there's, there's plain text and there's cipher text, well, you, anything that's been encrypted is, is that fancy word cipher. You, can't, you, you shouldn't be able to read it if you're not supposed to. Well, they're, they're, they, Bad actors are potentially collecting more and more data and holding on to it. And, and we know that you know there's a lot more storage out there and it's not infinite, but it's, it feels that way. They're gonna hold on to more stuff because maybe in 10 years, maybe in, in nine years, maybe in 12 years, they might have access to a system that would let them break it. And, and then the question is, was that ciphertext data so important and useful? Will it still be useful 12 years from now to that bad actor? Does it give them advantage? Does it does it take something away from you that you can never get back because it's not protected anymore? So that's terrifying in some respects. That there is data you're protecting today that may not be may not be protected in the future. Exposed. Become yeah. yeah becomes available and and there's a lot that's not trivial to do what I just described. But if if they if they you know knew the actors and and they could find. The, the, the keys that were used for the transactions, the, the idea is that this realizable quantum computer will break today's cryptographic algorithms in the public key model with, with secret and, um, and, and private and public keys. So that, that should scare the bejeebers out of you. And it just becomes one more of those questions of, of what am I, how am I protecting it? And, and then, you know, there will be advances and more communication about what kind of encryption 
uh, and the algorithms have used will we'll protect more. As, you know, we're, we're, and NIST is running a, 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 a selection process to pick the next set of algorithms, and, and that would replace today's public key encryption algorithms. So the same systems would likely work, but would not be breakable. And that's not trivial to inject new algorithms and, and you know, take a decade time frame sometimes to get all this stuff in place. Every transaction, you know, there's a lock on our window, you know, on our browser window today. That would be one place where that lock and its public key encryption underpinning would be modernized. And, and, and so then we, you'd have the full protection. You have that protection today because it can't be broken you know, in a trivial, there aren't quantum computers doing that today. So uh, you asked, you know, <laughs> there's, it, 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 it's just one more good reason to identify and know and, and understand your data so that you can also start asking yourself, that's the first data I need to move over to a, a post-quantum cryptographic algorithm system, you know, one that's got the new algorithms in it. Um, I think that becomes, that becomes the, the, the fancy part of the baseball here. And, and it, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, no, nicely put. And thanks for tying that all in, because you tied all the importance of-, of Well, and, 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 and that's guiltily, because I'm doing a project in that space too. And, and so we are going to, describe to technology providers how to identify where you have, you know, they, they often know where the algorithms are. They had to build them in there, but to, to help every manufacturer think about the transition when they need to upgrade to the next set of, of crypto algorithms that are post-quantum ready, then this this project will, will hopefully in, inform them. And it will also be, uh, I, I started talking about the Cloud Security Alliance. They have a clever thing, Y2Q. You know, remember Y2K, that's uh, 21 years ago, we were really worried that the computer systems were gonna cause problems because of two digits for years instead of four digits. And, and a lot of work went into making sure that nothing bad would happen when the clock ticked over from 1999 to 2000. Now, we don't know when the actual moment in Y2Q becomes a challenge, but, but it, 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 is, it is thought to be you know, realizable in our lifetimes. And, and therefore, we're starting now to start telling people, here's how to worry about that, here's how to prioritize, and how to migrate to your post-quantum cryptographic algorithms. Good. Big words. Yeah. yeah, and if you have your data ducks in a row, it would possibly probably. It, it's all about the prioritization. What do you want to do first? And why, you know, don't just, just because somebody did it always, always that way, we always encrypted that data, doesn't mean that they had really done the full value structure. Governments are good at this. Intelligence communities know how long data is valuable and unvaluable. And, and so there's, you know, they, they pick the kind of crypto to, to match that. And, and we ought to be able to do that in the, in the private sector more as we go forward with this migration. Bill, thanks so much for your insights about data and about security, we really appreciate it. You're welcome. I, I, I hope the, the FC asserts folks who hear this and anybody beyond, uh, you know, takes this to heart and, and, and figures out their strategy. At least start looking it up. Oh, they absolutely will. Uh, thanks again. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Bye. Well, you just heard from Bill Newhouse talking about his insights about the turning that the security world kind of has uh, made uh, from just being a mere data plumber, as it were, to really understanding what you're securing, kind of getting into the data side of it. Well, let's find out how the other half lives. Uh, let's talk to Meredith Dodd and her experience in getting into the world as a data analyst. Well, welcome everybody. We've got Meredith Dodd here, uh, who's a data scientist at Strata Decision Technology, a FinTech company that serves about half, 50%, is that right, Meredith? Yes, about just over 50% of our hospitals and healthcare systems in America. Well, tell us more about, about Strata, and then we'll get going about what a typical day looks like to you. Uh, about your background and some of the data work that you did with the ARM. But first, tell us a bit about Strata Decision Tech. Yeah, so Strata's whole mission is to help heal healthcare. And one of the ways that we do that is by providing all sorts of different budgeting software to hospitals and health systems. Um, and that main product is called Strata Jazz. But mm -hmm. I'm actually working on our secondary project, which is called Stratosphere Compare. And what that is, is a benchmarking software. It allows hospitals to be able to compare themselves um, on all sorts of different metrics. So 
finances, costs, labor, patient throughput, all of those things that you know your executives are looking for and you wanna be able to say, hey, we're in line with what others are doing. Okay, this is fantastic. Because one of the reasons why we chose uh, Meredith is not only is she an SME uh, in data, but it's a critical area of healthcare and things like that. Because if the bad people, right, attackers, are going after data. For example, in this particular, uh, we'll call it a vertical in the healthcare system or whatever, security folks need to know the moves that good guys make, right? And bad guys make as well. So Meredith, let's just kind of take a look at what a typical day looks like for you. Tell us a bit more about that. All right. So my typical day um we're on the agile process so we always start our day off with a daily stand-up kind of prepping for the day understanding what our our next moves are and any blockers that we have um and then the rest of my day is really a mix of collaboration i i tend to have some meetings in the morning um but i also have a lot of self-directed work um and who i'm collaborating with are other data scientists with different expertise in our particular area. So things like uh, the finance information is very different than the labor metrics we have. Those use different types of data. They have different types of expertise. Um, and so kind of on a daily level, that's what it's like. But on a monthly level, we're releasing data for that benchmarking product on a monthly basis. And so the beginning of our month is kind of prep work for that. We're looking at new development work. Um, adding new metrics to our, our set, adding new filters so that you can cut and slice the data different ways, and adding new capabilities. For instance, we recently added an outlier detection function to our Stratosphere Compare software. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of the, that development work happens at the beginning because towards the middle and the end of the month, we're all about the process for uploading that new data. So. In this case, we have a data engineer who is able to pull that data for us. Um, we have several data scientists who are currently uh, running that data, creating those metrics, cleansing our data. Um, and then we have a dedicated QA person that is able to look at it before release. Um, and so that's kind of our monthly cadence. So um, and part, let me stop you right there. There's three three kind of divisions, as it were. You said there the data engineers pull the data, right? Uh, and sorry, folks, data, data. Uh, we talked about the regional <laughs> uh, uh, differences in talking, but you got the engineer that pulls the data, got the data scientist, right? And they go in and take a look at the outlier. There was a third element. What was that third group that looks third like? Third element would be um, quality assurance. QA. So, now, let me QA. ask you this. Where, where does the data engineer pull that data from? Where uh, They get it from individual hospitals or, or what? Yeah, so our, our system is pretty cool and that um, our, our main product, Strategize, is able to take in and ingest all of that hospital or health systems data. Um, and so we're pulling it from our, our larger kind of back end there, um, mm -hmm. but they're, they're ingesting that already in a whole separate process. Are those, is that data uh, emails, is it data exhaust, is it, you know, what kind of is the nature of some of this data uh, that you're, that you're bringing in, just so everybody knows, uh, you know, from a security-ish perspective? Yeah, it, uh, by the time it gets to us, which again is not its original format, but I, I can speak to the, the time it gets to us, um, yeah. we're pulling it out of SQL databases. Okay. And we're just making the move to Snowflake. Okay, so so mostly SQL databases. Thanks. So I cut you off. I'm sorry. Keep going, this because this is. I just wanted to be clear where the data is coming from, and then you know what you're doing with it. So keep on going. Yeah. So I was just going to kind of mention what suite of programs I'm I'm using when I'm working on this on a day to day basis. So we use a lot of SQL, as I mentioned. I'm using that for a lot of our day to day troubleshooting. And then Python kind of runs a modularized suite of files that we're using for our main product. So that's where I have the most expertise. Sometimes we're doing some things here and there in other languages like R, but it's primarily SQL Python. So as far as the skills that are concerned, yeah, I mean, what I'm hearing, databases, right? Understanding SQL. Absolutely. Python. How did you, I'm curious, we're gonna talk about your background here in a second, then here's a way to kind of edge into that. But 
how did you get started in Python? Did you learn another language before that, or, or you were, was it Python your first language, or how did that work? Yeah, I absolutely did. So um, when I was in graduate school, I was doing my uh, PhD in health psychology, but it really focused on statistics um, and how to use those statistics to help improve a chronic pain clinic. Um, and so when I started there, I was actually using SPSS, which is pretty much dead RIP as <laughs> SPSS there, yeah. but um, really yeah. useful to get a lot of your inferential statistics and, and get a handle on smaller databases. Um, when I realized, it, when I moved to the Army Public Health Center, I was a quantitative data analyst, and there I kind of transitioned all of those same skills into SAS instead of SPSS. Um, and so I was able to kind of pick that up. It's, SAS is still a programming language, and so um, at my time in the Army, I also started learning and picking up Python. And I really added to that when I became the Director of Data Science Education with Wazoo. Python is really the way of the future. It's getting bigger and bigger all the time, especially for data science, machine learning, and engineering, all, it, it's picking up a lot of speed. So I had to be able to help teach our students and help write curriculum in Python as well. Let me ask, ask you this. Uh, you must be some sort of math genius, right? To figure all of these things out. Is that right? I, I'm sorry, I, we've talked about this. Ab before. Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> I am terrible at arithmetic. If you ask me to do like what everybody kind of thinks of as traditional math, I am horrible at it. Um, anything that requires a calculator, uh -uh, I'm done. Um, but statistics and data science are, are very different. You're, you're really using the skills of logic and kind of problem solving rather than computational like arithmetic or algebra for the most part, because you can set up the computer to do those things for you. You don't have to be good at math to be a good data analyst. That's good news because uh, yeah, if it, I, my kids did catch me. I actually did correctly uh, a little math problem in my head, uh, which is the first time I'd ever done that in my life. Uh, so, but I love technology. So I, I just, I think that's a great message. Um, you mentioned was you, right? That's Steve Wozniak. Steve, right? Wozniak, that is. You know, uh, I'm just curious, how did you get started doing that? Because you did remote work as the, what, the, the director of data science and education. Is that right? That's correct. So. Um, once I kind of had, I'd spent about three years with the Army Public Health Center, mm -hmm. and um, I was really interested in working remotely. I wanted to, to get out of the DC area, couldn't stand the traffic, um, and was ready to, to be able to work remotely. And so I took the position with WASU uh, to be able to do that, and uh, got, got my dreams fulfilled of living in, in the middle of the country, South Dakota and Arizona as well. So. Yeah, that was able to do that because it was remote work. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I, of course, now they're all working remotely and everything because of the, the, the pandemic and all that stuff. It's, it's exactly. Yeah, I did it first. Ah. Yeah, <laughs> you, you are the leader. So does that make you a trendsetter or an outlier or how, how would that work in terms of being <laughs> able to work? Absolutely. Yeah, um, and anything kind of outside the, the normal ranges. So in this case, if we're talking working remote work in the pandemic, anything probably outside of that 20, 2020 to 2021 end range, we're probably gonna start seeing outliers there. <laughs> well, before we uh, you know, kind of get into some of these, uh, uh, some of the kinds of things that you do even deeper in, in the day in life, in the day in life, I'm curious about the Army public uh, health center. You know, what kind of work did you do? And let's uh, get as specific as possible just to give a kind of a snapshot. Yeah, so as I said, um, my official job title is quantitative data analyst. I want to be very clear for all of you legal people out there. Um, I was a full-time embedded contractor, um, technically with Oak Ridge Institute for Science Education. Um, so not, not technically like a Department of the Army civilian or anything, just so we're all on the same page there. <laughs> um, but what I was doing really was I was a program evaluator um, for several different programs. Um, the Army Wellness Centers, for instance, is a program that we have worldwide. Um, last I heard, they had about 40 centers implemented, I believe. That is helpful for 
helping soldiers, their family, Department of Army civilians be able to meet their health goals, um, trying to help decrease risk factors for chronic disease like body mass index or body fat, um, and, and really be able to, to get in shape in a, in a happy way. Um, so, and so- Let me stop you right there. So the whole idea mm -hmm. was, was um, okay, whatever whatever health and wellness indicators could be, image and BMI, for, for example, right, and, and other things. So the idea is to collect as much data and then come up with programs that really help uh, uh, GI Jane or Joe or whomever. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. Okay. So they have a really interesting kind of personalized health coaching program there um, in which soldiers and their families um, can come in and get assessed at periodic intervals. Usually it's once a month as possible. Um, mm -hmm. So they can, whatever their goal is, we're going to assess them kind of evidence-based on what their progress has been and help them set new goals to carry onward. Um, so if I say, you know, I want to lose weight, that's great if you walk away and say, okay, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to lose weight. But if you never measure yourself again, or you never check your body fat to see if that's decreasing, you don't know what progress you've made and you start to lose interest really fast, right? If you're not seeing any visible results, it's, it's hard to kind of make those wholesale life changes. Um, and so the Army Wellness Center is all of their um, staff collected all of this information on every client they saw. Um, and that went into a, a, a database that we helped design. Um, we had some, some other people working on that as well, but kind of provided input into that. And then was able to get data extracts in which we can see if these Army Wellness Centers are actually effective at helping their clients meet their health goals. So, so we stop here, we stop right there. So it's so interesting to me because you know, there have been programs and wellness programs for, you know, decades, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that are very much, you know, kind of right once and apply to the same to everywhere. It sounds like you're coming up with a program that's very individualized, you know, for, for each individual person, right? Exactly. And, and that's important. And something else that you said there, um, there have been, there have been tons and tons of different wellness programs that the Army and Department of Defense have gone through. One of the things that as a data analyst, as a program evaluator, that we try to do is see if they're actually working, right? We don't want to keep throwing money at something that we know is not necessarily effective or that we've never tested and we have no idea of whether it's actually working or not. Um, and so my work was able to see that, hey, this worldwide program is actually helping our clients, our soldiers, our family members decrease their risk factors for chronic disease. So we actually saw significant um, decreases in body mass index and body fat. Um, so showing that this program is actually working. That's and of course that can help with funding. Thank you, thank you. Let me ask you, you said it was stored in a database. Was that database somewhere in a data center somewhere? Was it stored in the cloud somewhere? Or do you remember? Uh, data, data center. That's it. Okay, thank you. So, so basically, what you realized, right? The reason why you got into this space was because you felt you could make some major changes there. As a as a as a data analyst, how does that work for you? What was the insight or the kind of epiphany that you had? And yeah. as a data analyst, what epiphany did you have? Yeah. So I absolutely believe that data can change the world. Um, when we're collecting it all and you're able to analyze it to really get some information back, you can get it to the right people to make changes. We can help with, we can help chronic pain patients return back to work. That was what my, my graduate work was all about. We can help soldiers and their families become healthier. Um, one of the other programs I worked with for the Army Public Health Center, we helped clinicians be able to manage their stress levels related to always serving um, patients all the time, right? And having to put patient needs before their own. Um, here at Strata, I've been able to really help small healthcare companies provide extra data on where they're doing well and where they still need to have improvements and ultimately be able to not just increase the quality of their patient care, but also decrease their costs because we know that a lot of our hospitals really have very low margins um, and, and aren't doing as well as they probably could be financially. 
So basically, not only are you improving a program for the individuals, but you're basically making it possible to really verify that, look, there, there's a cost here and we're keeping costs down, we're making it efficient. Absolutely. Data is changing the world every way you can think of. Um, we can use data in pretty much every industry to make these kinds of changes. I just happen to be more familiar with the healthcare side of things. So when it comes to uh, uh, taking, getting a hold of this data, what are some of the, you, uh, okay, so you get a bunch of data, you've got it stored in the database. What are some ways that you say manipulate the data and visualize it? Or am I jumping over a, a few steps before I talk about, you know, is there something else to talk about in terms of actual data manipulation steps that you do and then how you go ahead and visualize it? Yeah, so I, I think that there are, you will spend most of your time wrangling data is what we call it. Being able to process it in a way that you can actually use it. Um, sometimes that's called transformation as well. Um, so that could be anything from kind of re recoding and reclassifying it into groups you're actually interested in looking at. Mm -hmm. um, that could be changing the shape of the data. Sometimes we have records written kind of um, a long way with each, each row kind of unique to going to, to like a, a tall way in which you've got repeats, but a fewer columns, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that would be data transposition all sorts of different ways we need to look at it, aggregate it, be able to kind of group it together and examine it that way. You'll spend most of your time doing these sorts of cleanups. Um, people, when they enter data, right, for surveys or other things, it doesn't always come in the same way. And so you kind of have to do a lot of cleanup to make sure that your all caps writing is the same as your lowercase writing is the same as your camel case and those sorts of things. So that kind of wrangling. So the idea that if I somehow had all caps on or, or the programmer set it up so that all caps were coming in. So I guess that means we'd be shouting our data, right? Uh, but uh, <laughs> so that is that that's part of the data wrangling. Absolutely it is. Now, how do you go when you're when you're wrangling that data as it were, uh, let's say we live in some sort of uh, post-truth society where you can mess around with the data and make it, you know, come to whatever conclusion you want. But how do you make sure as you do that, that you're somehow not affecting the integrity of the data that you're, if, that you are right? If, if you yeah. don't it, Data integrity is an absolutely crucial component to the field of data analytics. Um, it, it is so important that as someone who works with data, that I am as truthful about what I have done and as, as transparent kind of showcasing what's happened with that because my trust with my client who's using that data is something that once you lose it, it's gone forever. So it's very important to make sure that you're, you are safeguarding that data and, and doing the best that you can with it to not end up showcasing whatever they want you to, right? We shouldn't have an agenda um as we're doing our data manipulation um i think some of the best ways to do that right we, we have some kind of understandings or best practices and how you might do that through your data wrangling but i also think it's very important to be able to be transparent with your clients so for instance um in strata we have like it must be almost 90 pages documentation of exactly how we're calculating each metric and where the source of that metric data is coming from. Now, most people aren't gonna take the time to go read that document and that's fine. But if you do have questions and you have it, want that information, we're happy to provide it because we don't have anything to hide. So you, you, you expose as it were the methodology and you, you're very- Absolutely. About it. So important. As you're doing that kind of manipula uh, oh, oh, manipulation, is that when you're using Python, for example, or are you, putting things into spreadsheets and working with it that way, or, or are you sticking mostly with some sort of database application? Mostly Python, every once in a while in SQL as well, um, though that's not necessarily SQL strength. Um, it can do some aggregation, for instance, using your group by clause um, really well, but you wanna stay away from spreadsheets um, for the most part when you're talking about very large quantities of data because two things. The first is that it can't handle really crazy large amounts of data. It taps out at about, I think it's 500,000 rows of data. 
which it used to be just fine, but is definitely not these days when we're talking about millions or billions of records on a routine basis. So it can't hold all of that data. And it also has a limit on the number of columns as well. So depending on what you're doing, you run into that limitation as well. Um, and then the second issue I find with Excel is that you don't have a record of everything that you've done. You can go through, check, click through things, make modifications, but there's no record of what changes you've made to that Excel document. Um, if you're doing that change in Python, you're coding it out. And so you have kind of a script, you have a record of what's happened that you can then showcase to anybody who wants to know what's going on so that you can reference it if you need to go back and further so that you have it in the future if you're, you have sustainability. You need to do this on multiple data sets. You can easily do that. You don't have to go through and make those same changes one at a time for every data set you have, like you would in a spreadsheet. As you're manipulating data, are you also working within certain, how should I put it, applications, uh, specific applications that, say, a healthcare provider is using or, or what have you? Yeah, I'm currently not using those kinds of applications, but I absolutely know that others in the industry are. Um, lots of transform data makes its way into APIs um, to be available to, uh, I would say, general public in terms of who has the skills to be able to access that API, but yeah. And our, our government is actually excellent. We have data.gov um, in which a lot of our public facing data information related to everything from healthcare to um, transportation is available on that website for anyone to be able to download files and utilize them. Interesting, thank you very much. You mentioned earlier some things that I, I don't know if everybody in the audience knows. You mentioned, for example, SAS, for example. Mm -hmm. most people, I think most people know, you know, is the manipulation language, as it were, for databases and things like that. Tell us about SAS. You also mentioned, I think, uh, M2, SPSS. Tell us more about those things real quick. Yeah, so SAS is an older programming language um, that has a lot of really good statistical applications. Um, it's not being used as much anymore. A lot of people are, are shying away from it, partially because it has a really high licensing cost um, at the enterprise level. But it, excuse me, um, it can be used for, um, a, a lot of businesses are still using it, and I would say healthcare is still using it somewhat. Okay. Um, and then uh, specifically to the military, we have M2, which is kind of a data mart in which you're able to extract your military healthcare data. Um, and it, so I use data, that. Is a data mart something that allows you to say, okay, here's what I want, here's what I don't want, that type of thing? It, Sorry. Exactly, exactly. So um, a data mart is kind of a self serve access to a larger pool of data. So you've got um, this that huge database of, here, the data mart is here, and it allows you to kind of pick and choose. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, and so when I was working with the Army Public Health Center, we were able to go in and look at particular time frames and get updated information on the clients and their visits to the Army Wellness Center. That's what I was using that for. Okay. Okay. And then SPSS, is that along the same lines? Yeah. Yeah. So SPSS is even older uh, than SAS. Oh, okay. Um, and so really it, that's used a lot. I think it's statistical program, something, something social sciences, maybe, um, acronym wise, uh, but the acronym is fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a kind of point and click program, um, that IBM put out that allows you to do inferential statistics and kind of be able to modify your data with some some kind of spreadsheet capability, but on a more advanced level. Um, did have some programmatic elements like you would type in and add additional data to look at and that sort of thing. Um, probably it's analog to today is more like Tableau. It's meant to bring access to data to the masses, as it were, that doesn't have a lot of experience. So it's a point and click way to get easy information out. Now, the in easy information for SPSS, that was statistics. Um, but for Tableau, it tends to be more visuals and graphics 
though there is a statistics component to Tableau as well. You can do some trending and forecasting, that sort of thing. Now, we took a kind of a deep dive into some of these things. You know, you mentioned SQL, for example, and Python mm -hmm. and uh, M2 and things like that. How long would it, and, and Tableau, how long would it take somebody to get into this? Because some people might be thinking, hey, it's going to take me years. I have to get a master's degree in something to, in order to even start in this, in this pathway. What are uh, uh, some of the average timelines, as it were? Or, you know, what do you need to know? Yeah, I would say absolutely not. You don't need a master's degree. You don't need tons and tons of advanced time. Um, when I was working with Wazoo, we had a eight and a half month boot camp program for data science. So what are some of the first steps down the, the data pathway uh, for people to get to know whether they're, because I've seen a lot of people who from the very beginning, you know, they're just saying, look, I've heard about data analytics, don't have any background, but there are other people who have, say, deep background in IT who need to understand the data side of things. So Absolutely. how did you get started? Was it from a, like a statistics perspective, it sounds like? Yeah, yeah, you can transition many different ways. And I think there's a really good leap between IT and data. Um, that pathway probably involves kind of more the data engineering route, getting really good at the, the database management and permissions, and then kind of um, transitioning over a little bit more to database creation than to using the databases, right? That, that's kind of one pathway in. Okay. Um, for myself, I definitely came at it from a statistics perspective. Um, that, that's what I learned first. And then I started to add in those programming layers. So I added SAS. First, which was which was older, um, then was able to layer in Python, R, SQL as I kind of built through things. And even now, I you never stop learning. I'm continuing to learn here at Strata. I'm getting a better idea of the data engineering kind of role that comes in as well. How many years have you been at this at this point now? When I say at this, in in the the data analytics side of things. Yeah, so I have about 12 years of experience in data as a whole. But you don't need to have 12 years of experience before you start, you know, at, at your first job, as it were. Absolutely not. Um, data science continues to be one of the fastest growing fields um, and for jobs across the world. And so there are, are lots of needs for entry level positions as data analysts, business analysts, marketing analysts, basically any kind of flavor of analysts you can think of, um, we need people to be able to analyze that data and extract insights that people can use to better further their company, or even our nonprofits are even using analysts to make sure that what they're doing is actually helping the population they're trying to help. Some of the specific job roles that you've seen real quick, we just got a, a, a you know, minute or so left, but some of the job roles that you've seen that, that uh, you know, that, that are specifically focused on data? Yeah, so um, I would say, well, like I was mentioning, any kind of analyst, operations analyst, finance analyst, business intelligence analyst, data analyst, marketing analyst, um, are all some of the more entry level positions. Um, in terms of contracting with the military or Department of Defense, um, there are a lot of different GS positions around mm -hmm. for the positions of data analysts and data scientists. So if that's something you're interested in, you know, <laughs> look on the dreaded uh, jobs.gov and, and see what you can see because there are a lot out there. Um, I'll also tell you that the Navy has kind of a built in like analyst adjacent kind of component mm -hmm. there. Um, so their data administration specialty area qualification matrix kind of has that like transition point, I would say, from IT into data analytics work. Um, the thing I will say, let me be clear, um, you may see positions for intelligence analysts, right? That's, especially when we're talking DOD, that's more related to intelligence gathering rather than the data analyst stuff that I'm talking about, but they have the same word analyst, so just to, to kind of be aware of that. No, that's good. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. And then uh, uh, there's also like the nice, uh, the NIST nice initiative, right? You can go in there and there's there's things that talk about data analytics as well, things like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, and I'll say that anything related to like evaluation as well, usually are using data skills. So 
It could be program evaluation, like I was doing with the Army Public Health Center. It could be policy evaluation, trying to see if our policies are really helping those that we meant to put in place um, or doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? Uh, related to, to government work, that's a, a big industry in itself. Let's finish this discussion here and talk about some specific and real key data manipulation skills that, that are important uh, for people to know in various uh, walks of data analytics, you know, recoding data, grouping, things like that. Absolutely. Um, so you hit on a big one, lots of data recoding to be done. Um, also, you know, any sort of filtering we need to do, transposing data, um, being able to aggregate it, our, our big ones are probably summing data or taking averages, getting mids and maxes. Mm. Um, you might need to create whole new fields based on old data, so kind of put it, put it together, doing a calculated field, um, ordering data in the right way so that it can be understood appropriately. All of those are, are good ones to have in your back pocket. Well, Meredith, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think, I, I love your phrase, you know, data can change the, uh, the world especially if you know you know what to do with it how to how to work with it so uh, thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it absolutely it's my pleasure <laughs> all the best man. well thank you everybody for joining in on this boot camp i want to specifically thank chris uh bill and meredith for their time and putting this together uh for those of you who want to learn more about data analytics and security i wrote a blog on it you can check that out you can go to my uh, uh blog just google it uh comptia james stanger and data analytics you should be able to find that uh, more importantly take a look at the it industry help thank you I just wanted to thank everybody for joining. Uh, as far as the uh, presentation is concerned, I am more than happy to share any of these slides with you. I have them available. Who here uh, still, uh, still here has my card? I think several of you do. If you don't, come on over and I'd be happy to uh, uh, share the slide deck that explains some of the uh, things that we found and does the research talking about data, data analytics, and talks about security. Uh, apologies for the glitch that we had in terms of the video and the audio. Uh, what we can do is I can even, uh, to be honest, what I can do is I can even share that video for you if you wanted to watch it later on without the glitches, I can do that as well. I'll stop right here if anybody has any questions, but I'd be uh, happy to take them uh, offline instead of uh, doing it here from the, uh, from the podium. We can, uh, I can the reason this is important is, is it discusses the importance of security thank you very much and data very as a combination. Take care. Bye-bye. If you want to learn more about some of the jobs that are available having to do with uh, data in IT, you can check out Cyber States. It's where you basically you can take a look at the cyber workforce needs in your particular area. Uh, you can drill right down into specific states, into specific uh, information. Uh, that can tell you a lot more about the types of job roles that are out there. From a more general perspective, there's CyberSeq, where you can visualize uh, security uh, as well. It's pretty cool stuff. If you want to contact me, go ahead and contact me on my email, jstanger at comptia.org.